you've just had an introduction to me, but you'll see why I just want to give you a bit more of my background. I started off as a mathematician and wandered through lots of development of theory, Bayesian stats, decision theory, decision analysis. I, I lived in Greek symbols, you know, all those funny things with blackboards and, and all of that. Um, and that took me up to about 1990. And then, in 1990, I was rung up by a guy who said, do you want to come out to Chernobyl on the International Chernobyl Project? Now, that's an offer you really can't refuse, isn't it, a picnic at Chernobyl. Um, so, this was four years after the accident. They wanted us to investigate how decision-making had taken place, whether it was good or bad or anything else. It was done by the United Nations, the International Atomic Energy Agency. So, being a great mathematician and, and, a, and a computer one at that, um, I wandered out to Chernobyl in 1990, clutching what they laughingly called a portable computer in those days. It weighed about 20 kilos. Um, and arrived there with all my risk management, risk analysis theory and, and all of that. And what did I find? A wall of emotion. It was my road to Damascus moment, if you like, because I arrive out there and suddenly none of the mathematics works because everything is political, it's social, it's cultural, and above all it's emotion. And how do you deal with that? So I had a fortnight to go through a learning process about behaviour and things like that. Whether I made it or not is neither here nor there, but after that I end up working with Department of Health during the 90s, helping them build up their risk communication. So um, if you remember they had a few health scares. If you think about it, during the 2000s, they've had a lot less bad publicity for the way they handled health scares and health, health and things. So we worked with them on risk communication. We set up the Food Standards Agency, um, again recognising that something that people may remember, the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries, math, had just about lost every bit of public confidence going. And the Food Standards Agency hasn't done badly, because it's recognised from the start <coughs> behavioural things are really important and you have to talk to people in ways they understand. And since Chernobyl, I've been really involved with emergency management, so I've just done a report on emergency management in the NHS and everything else. Um, so I've, over my career, if I'm right, I've moved from the analytic to the practical and it's been driven by my road to Damascus, okay? That's about me. Let's have some hands showing about you. Who's read that book? It's bestseller, Times bestseller list at the moment, non-fiction I'm afraid. Um, Thinking Fast and Slow, it's by a guy called Daniel Kahneman. Should be by two guys, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, but sadly Amos died many a year ago now. But the work they did in the 70s and 80s <coughs> revolutionised how we think about decision making and how people do make decisions as opposed to how they should make decisions. And this is sort of their work distilled down, it's published 2011. It's great read. If you haven't read it, I really recommend it to you. And I'll put the last slide up and it will doubtless be on the website afterwards. Um, the, the fact that you haven't read it is great because I've cribbed the rest of the slides. Um, okay, a couple of questions. How many of you forget things? I have senior moments. Some of you may be eligible for senior moments, but most of you are too young. But do you forget things? Okay. How many of you are rational or bad decision makers? One or two are saying yes, but typically people own up to the first, they complain about their memory, but they're much more reluctant to complain about their judgment. They, do, they don't say, oh, I'm a lousy judge. It's good to say you're a bad mathematician. It's good to say you haven't got good memory, but I can't speak English and I can't make decisions. Those are things you don't say too much. We're really proud of our decision-making ability at various levels, and certainly more comfortable with it than our, our memories sometimes. So let me ask you something. Let's get you to make a judgment. If you've seen this before, I expect you've forgotten it anyway, but if you haven't, <laughs> um, try, try just to take it at gut level. You're a public health official. There's an influenza epidemic expected. Um, on average, you reckon it's going to lead to 600 deaths. You've got two vaccines, an established vaccine and a new one. You're pretty sure the established vaccine would save 200 people. Um, 
the, the new one, B, you're not sure about. There's a um, third chance it'll work and save 600, and two thirds chance of saving none. Two vaccines can't be put together, they're contraindicated. So which are you going to choose to do? You're a public health official. Show of hands, folks. Who chooses A? Ooh. Who chooses B? Gosh, you're like lemmings. Straight to the side. <laughs> This, this question been, was posed first in the late 70s by Kahneman and Tversky. Since then, all of us who've taught management science, who've taught stats, all of us who've worked in industry and everything else working on decision making have used this with people. We know to pretty high accuracy, much better than your user stats, you know I mean? <laughs> These are down. Three quarters of people, hang on, let's get this one, prefer A. One quarter prefer B. Absolutely. Everybody. Statisticians, medics, man on the street, woman on the street, whoever you show it to, that's the sort of proportions you get. Okay? Trouble is, if I showed you that one, and I didn't change much, did I? I changed save 200 to lead 400, lead to 400 of the population dying, and I chose a third chance of saving 600 <coughs> to a third chance of no deaths, and two-third chance of 600 deaths. Okay? If I show you that one, three quarters of you would prefer B, on average, and one quarter A. In other words, I've switched preference just by changing the wording. If you frame things positively, and let's face it, saving life is about the most positive thing you can do. If you frame things positively, you make people risk-averse. They like certainties. Okay? So they go with A. If you frame things negatively, and death, dying, is pretty negative, people become risk prone. They take a risk to get out of the mess. <coughs> if you're in a hole, you know, if you're a tree or whatever it is, you've got to try and do something. You've got to take a risk. And so people switch their preferences. So I can change risk preferences by how I communicate with you. So that's slightly worrying if you're in the sort of management of health, safety, risk business. Okay? I mean, one of my friends, Emma Stone, who's now at London School of Economics, she worked in the City of London looking at computer screens. She was a psychologist, and around about 2000, she pointed out all the computer screens were framed in terms of losses, so they were making bankers risk-prone, willing to take risks, and that's exactly what you want a banker to do, and of course, nothing happened of it over the next 10 years. Um, but the banking industry didn't know it about, didn't want to know about the answer. The banking industry was arrogant enough to go back to what I was saying on an earlier slide. We are good decision makers, we don't need you to tell us. We're not like the average person, we're bankers. Well, that's right. Um, <laughs> another question. Who's more likely to be mugged in an inner city area? You or an old age pensioner? Anybody want to make a comment, suggestion? You. You. Yeah. Um, as in me, I was meaning as in you. <laughs> Typically, if you're a psychologist and you ask this question, you find out that most people think that the old age pensioner you I normally do in universities, so I've got young students, well at least a lot younger than me. Um, and most people, when they get this question, they think about it and they remember pictures like that. An old age pensioner being mugged. And when you've got something that's really emotive, really memorable, you've all seen photos like that on the local paper headlines or everything else, it comes up in your memory. If you think about average man in the street, or average student in the street, then, then you don't get the newspaper reports of that person being mugged. So your perception becomes biased, and you think old age pensioners are more likely to be mugged. Anybody else want to make a comment on that? <coughs> young men are more likely to be mugged than young women. Possibly. Mm -hmm. They're more likely to have better stuff on you if you're a young person. <laughs> yeah, you're more likely to be rich. <laughs> That's more likely to happen at night when old age pensioners might not be out. Yeah, all of those things. This, I love this question because Kahneman and Tversky posed it purely as a psychologist. And they, 
they came up with that availability thing saying that you remembered the memorable events. But if you're a statistician like I was once, then one of the things you say about this thing is the question's meaningless because it doesn't really tell you whether it's at night or day. It doesn't tell you whether you're talking about the same street. Are you talking about an old age pensioner and a um, student walking down a street, young man or woman or whatever it is? It doesn't give you the exposures. And we all know in terms of health and safety and risk, you need to talk about exposure. You know, how long you're exposed to the risk. And an operational researcher, which I've also had dallied in my career, where you're helping things become more efficient. Well, if you've got an old age pensioner and a young person running down the street, the good OR person will say to the mugger, go and get the young person first, beat them to a pulp, take their wallet and their iPad or whatever it is. Then you can get the old age pensioner as well because she won't have had time to run away. <laughs> so we get things, we get availability bias from psychology, we get meaningless and, and the need to ask intelligent questions from the statistics, and we get things about optimal strategy from operational research. And you can, this question goes deeper and deeper as you play with it. What I've been working towards <coughs> is our gut reactions to how we think about things are, are set up by um, lots of psychological pressures and they're not the same thing as analysis, okay? So there are two types of thinking. Way back in about 1990-ish, they were called systems one and systems two thinking. But they haven't come out now into the sort of even into the academic literature, people weren't talking about systems one and systems two thinking to about the last five years, when Daniel Kahneman started promoting and it has turned into his book. And his whole book is about system one and system two thinking. System one is about your intuition, your gut reaction. It's about how you respond to stimuli without thinking analytically in your mind about what you should be doing. It's based on much simpler forms of thinking, and it's very fast. I mean, I always think about it as systems one thinking is what's hardwired into your brain, because when your brain was being hardwired, you were likely to <coughs> walk out of your cave and meet a saber-toothed tiger, and you wanted pretty instantaneous response patterns to what you do when you meet a saber-toothed tiger. You know, it's not necessarily a great thing to run away from everything that frightens you, but our fright response is pretty good when there's a saber-toothed tiger there. So it's the hard wired, your gut reaction to things. And then we have system two thinking, which is much more about what I was doing in my early career. It's about writing down a structured formulation, doing some maths, doing some calculations, playing with some <coughs> of these programs that um, um, you're going to be seeing today or sold today. You know, it, it's doing it much more consciously, slowly, carefully, and everything else. And it doesn't lead to the same answers. If you think back to what I've been talking about, the gut reaction to the old age pensioner is slightly different to the statistician and the operational researcher's thinking. The one about health op and, and flu vaccines, you jumped one way or the other just on the presentation, but the analysis might lead you to either of them. You'd probably do some risk analysis and <laughs> so on there. It's much slower, which is why that book by Kahneman Tversky is called Thinking Fast and Slow, because it's the detailed evaluation. And I would say, just in case anybody says it, um, doing something analytically doesn't mean you forget about emotion and value and things like that. It means you deal with them explicitly. It means you surface them, and I'm, in risk management, you, when you're handling risks, you surface what matters to people in terms of what the outcomes are, and you deal with how you mitigate and protect against problems with those. So what it's saying is that we're all sort of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Systems one thinking, we're still Stone Age man. Systems two thinking, we're analytical and scientific. Okay? And if we go back to my career, You'll notice, as I said, I sort of started off developing Systems 2 theory with a lot of people. And since then, I've been applying it. So I've had to work with people who think Systems 1 and react to Systems 1. 
And it means that in risk management, in developing safety procedures, in communicating, in just about everything, you need to remember that you design using System 2. You want to be rational with your design, but you have to do it in a context where you recognise that the people who respond may not be using Systems 2 thinking. That they may well be using Systems 1 thinking. In some cases, in, in sort of control rooms and everything else, you have standard operating procedures for emergencies, which forces them to use Systems 2 thinking in an emergency. But their gut reaction will almost certainly be Systems 1. And you have this tension. And what, how you communicate, how you set up procedures, has to recognise that tension. So, I'm, I'm being scared here because Karen in a moment is going to talk about culture. Culture is a wonderfully misused, well, multiple used word. There are lots of meaning of culture. And I, I use it in the lay sense, um, not the technical sense. But, but it's, it's sort of something about how we as a group behave and so on. And I guess you've all seen that, well, many of you seen this photo, this picture? It's classic. All of you who've seen it before and loads of you looking at it now, you might be able to see a young lady. There's her chin, there's her nose, there's her eyebrows. She's got this lovely shawl on and a big stole. Can you see her? And there's an old hag there with a mouth and a big pointed nose down here. Um, she's sort of in a, well, yeah, she's just a hag and a hood. You can see her? Well, I've got a mate who's Canadian and he did some work with some Inuits. Um, they can't see the old lady or the young lady. The reason they can't see the old lady and the young lady is in their Victorian history, that clothing, both sets of those clothing weren't around. So what do they see? Can anybody tell me? Can anybody see anything else there? A waterfall. A waterfall? Maybe. I haven't seen the waterfall. Where? Well, this, given the time, I'll, I'll point out, they see an eagle. Can you see the beak? The eye of the eagle? The head? <coughs> Except some of them see the beaver. There's the beaver's nose. Can you see? An Amazonian Indian see a tree frog. So how you perceive and how you decode that picture depends on the culture you're coming from. Now any risk communication message, any risk, communica any risk strategy, how it's received will depend on the culture into which you put it. Which would be easy if there was a culture into which you put it. But in most of the world where you exist, you put it into lots of people coming from lots of different cultures, all of whom perceive those messages in different ways. And the trick I use in writing communications, and the Department of Health use now and, and various other places, is some cultural theory that comes from Mary Douglas, but there's a whole range of them. And it, let me just state before it starts, this doesn't say that everybody out there lies <coughs> in one of these four cultures. And it doesn't say that everybody is unchanging in their culture. It says that in a population, in a context, in a particular period of time, in a particular circumstances, in a reasonably large population, there will be people behaving and hearing like each one of the four I'm going to show you. It doesn't say there'll be the same people next year, but it just says there will be people out there at this time behaving like that. You'll have entrepreneurial people who see risk as opportunity. You know, if there's no risk, you can't make a lot of money. But if there's no risk, you obviously can't do things. As a researcher in universities, my life is a risk. I stand there and I put my hypotheses up, saying, I think this is happening. And more often than not, the world comes around and says, no, it's not. And your paper doesn't get published or whatever it is. But it's a, it's a challenge. You take the risk. And then you have hierarchists who probably you're most representing in your professional jobs. A hierarchist believes that risks are okay, but you've got to regulate them, you've got to put in safety procedures, you've got to take care of them, you've got to manage them within set limits. There's my mother who used to walk around the house singing K Sera Sera, for anybody who can remember Doris Day. Not that Doris Day was my mother. Um, <laughs> but what will be will be a fatalist who don't really worry about the future risks, they just accept them. And people are like that. I mean, my mother is genuinely like that. 
she is the most easy to get on with person simply because tomorrow's another day and, and that comes out and then you have egalitarians um, emotively you can call them tree huggers but they tend to be the people who worry about the environment worry about the future generations worry much more about things like that now if you're writing a risk message or if you're putting up a safety procedure it often helps just to go down, stand along the list like this and say, OK, I'm going to role play an entrepreneur. How will he or she read this? What words in it will they react to? Can I change those words so they don't react in that way if that's what I want them to do? You know, those sort of things. And the same with the hierarchists and all the others. And to give you an example, I've got about another three minutes. Thinking? Nobody's telling me. I've got 20. Um, um, give you an example. I was in running a workshop and we were doing some decision analysis. We were trying to choose different strategies. And doing that, you score the different strategies against different criteria. Okay? And we were busy scoring. And there was, it was an environmental issue, and there was a couple of environmentalists, particularly one girl who was an, really strong from an environmental movement. She wasn't quite representing Greenpeace, but it was that sort of background. And she timed out. If you're running a meeting of about 20 people, you can tell when people sort of sit there, read, play with their iPads, whatever it is, out. Wasn't in it. And I wanted her opinions. We were trying to get to a consensus or a variety of views that showed <coughs> what was going on in the room. And if I couldn't get her view, I couldn't feed it in. So I eventually said, you know, you're not happy with this, are you? Why? And she said, you can't score things on the environment. So I thought she was telling me you couldn't put numbers in. But after a while, it became clear. She said, you can't score because score is good. That's what they do in football. Well, if you're lucky, it's what they do in football. <laughs> um, you know, scoring is good. What we're talking about is environmental impact, and they're bad. I can't score them. I can't give them goals. So we changed the word to talk about impact. And she jumped in and played. And it was because the word had a meaning to her that it didn't have to other people that it was getting in the way. And that happens time and again. So I'm sure I'm teaching a lot of you to suck eggs, but think of communication as an action and then test out that action by role playing it against different people who might be out there. It really works. It really helps people. Don't think about exchanging information. Yeah, that's going on. But you're actually trying to create a behavior. So you're, you're doing something. Um, two ways clearly better than one way because you can check out words like I did with this girl on risk, um, score and so on. But if it's at least one way, go back to those stakeholder things and role play it because you can hear how other people might say it. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say. Um, I've been talking about Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. It really is a good book. If you want to read a book on this subject, that's the one to read. I dared to put up a book that I wrote with John Moore and Nadia Papamichael. Um, that's much more about how you do things, not what's going on in people. Um, I come out of, if you saw, mass decision analysis. John Moore is a trained psychologist, so he was bringing the psychological stuff. <laughs> Nadia is um, a computer scientist by background, a management scientist. So we had all those perspectives coming in and about how you bring it together. But the real thing I'm trying to get across in this bit is that when you're playing with these games, you have to think system two. You have to be analytical because that's your job. But you have to recognize that other people are coming back at you with system one. And that's, that's the message. Okay.